I'm one of the founders of the Argus Institute. I um, helped start the Changes Program, Changes Support for People and Pets Program in 1984, and uh, was one of the first directors of the Argus Institute when it started in the uh, 90s. So um, I was there at the most exciting time at CSU when we were first sort of helping this uh, emerging field of pet loss counseling in veterinary medicine um, come to be. So the Argus Institute is responsible for a lot of the breakthroughs in this field. And in the 35 uh, years that it's been there, um, it's really changed the face of veterinary medicine. The, the, the changes program, I, I thought, interviewed Withrow, and I, it's up for debate. He has me his memory didn't, didn't uh, okay. serve him well in this regard. Tell me, tell me how that came about. <laughs> I could tell you so many stories. Um, well. I was on the faculty in the Human Development and Family Studies Department here at CSU. Um, we have a grief counseling uh, sort of uh, area of interest. We had experts there, and I was one of the people that was really majoring in grief counseling. Um, it's a family therapy program. And uh, one day we got a call from Steve over at the vet school, and he said, you know, I have an animal cancer center here. I have people bringing their pets from all over the country. They are very emotional, and I don't know what to say to them. I don't know what to do. Could you guys help? And so four of us who were um, graduate students and faculty people decided to go over there and see what it was all about and kind of experiment a bit. So we started a trial program where we would just go over two mornings a week and sit in the waiting room and literally look around and see if people looked upset or if they were crying. And if they were, we would go talk to them. And the program started as a volunteer program with Steve and grew from there into a full-time program like it is today with research and full-time counseling. We developed a comprehensive uh, curriculum when I was there for all four years of the veterinary program. And um, you know, we got tremendous support from faculty and from students and even from Dean Voss, who um, initially, when we were trying to get funding for the program, I was sitting in Steve's office one day saying, I can't keep doing this unless I get paid. I mean, come on. And he said, okay, let's call the dean. Let's see if we can get some money for you guys. So he gets on the phone with Dean Voss and he's explaining the whole program and what we're doing. And he goes, mm-hmm, uh-huh, okay, well, I'll talk to you later about it then. And he hung up and I said, what'd he say? And he said, well, he said, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. <laughs> and so Steve said, I think we're gonna have to wait a little bit to get some money from him. But Dean Voss came around and he became one of our biggest supporters. And in fact, when we were doing fundraising for the Argus Institute, he personally, out of his own pocket, was one of our biggest donors. Yeah, so it was pretty cool. The ultimate validation. Yeah, yeah. And really. Yeah, and you know, validation of this subject matter and how important it is to veterinary medicine. You know, that clients really understand that veterinarians understand their pain and understand the bond they have with their pets and that they want help you know when they have to say goodbye to their pets. Prior to that was it and I have a lot of pictures of this of Withrow and uh, Bill uh, Denier, I forget his name but I mean those early residents and yeah. whatnot yeah. and I, it seemed like you know they would talk you know the diagnosis would be terminal and they would have mm -hmm. to be in an exam room and, and yeah. here and Withrow or Bill or um, whomever would be on the whiteboard and they would discuss options, you know, and they would write up a few. Other. But then it was, I mean, it seemed like their default was to hand a box of Kleenex to the client. Oh, yeah. Who yeah. was way upset. I yeah. Mean, oh, yeah. Very, very upset. Yeah. And, and I can remember that. And they didn't, I'm like, Withrow didn't exactly shrug his shoulders, but it was like, you know, it was kind of that. Yeah. Hug, you know, yes. That a sur only a surgeon can give. Yeah. You know. So I mean. Yeah. Right from the start, it seemed like, what an innovative idea. Yeah. And, and invaluable. Well, you know, we when we came over there, when I first started there, um, clients weren't present at the euthanasias. Um, if they were there, which was very rare, the euthanasia was done on the cold, you know, uh, gurney top with everybody standing around and people would literally get weak need, you know, and need to sit down sometimes. 
So when we got there, we started assessing the situation from our perspective, you know, from having careers in human, you know, family therapy and grief counseling where it's completely different. You know, you're doing everything for the family or for the, for the cl uh, client to feel comfortable. So CSU is responsible for example for comfort rooms, which are ubiquitous all over the country in the world right now. Um, almost every private practice you go to now has a comfort room and they were started here because we said, look, people want a different atmosphere. They don't want to say goodbye to their pet in a sterile exam room, you know, standing next to a gurney. They want to be in a kind of a living room setting with lowered lighting. They want to sit on the floor. They might want to hold their pet. So, you know, it's to Steve Withrow and everybody else's credit that they went, oh, okay, really? You know? Um, and so we set up the first comfort room and um, they used to call it the chapel. <laughs> because the lighting was low and it was kind of a reverent atmosphere and everybody go oh, I gotta go into the chapel today and do a euthanasia but you know it was just because they felt a bit uncomfortable with that atmosphere because they were medical professionals but they did it and they they soon saw the results and you know Withrow would be the first person to say that his team got more thank yous after they put a, an animal down than they did if they saved their life because people were so grateful that they made it so comfortable for them and that they had such support. So CSU, the Argus Institute is responsible for comfort rooms, for um, the training curriculum that is all over the country now at most vet schools, even Kathy Cooney who has the CADA Institute now and is going around training all over the world. It's based on our curriculum and our training. Um, clay paw prints uh, that almost every Vet school and almost every uh, private practice does started with the changes program and with the Argus Institute. And that tradition is everywhere also. Um, so, you know, really a lot of breakthroughs were made. And I think it was the combination of having grief experts and then the cancer center. Because the cancer center brought in enough emotionally bonded people and enough clients that we truly could get a good feel for what people wanted. And we were in on so many cases. We were there from diagnosis you know, to the end. We had a clinical program that really is still rare. Um, most veterinary teaching hospitals don't have that kind of clinical experience for the grief counselors, if there are grief counselors. So you know, it's truly a unique little laboratory um, in the Argus Institute, and it's responsible for veterinary medicine having um, the ability to really show their hearts because you know veterinarians have such big hearts and this really allows them to show how much they care. The, you know, the, the science gets in the way of the heart. Yeah, you know? yeah. the mean, medicine gets the in medicine the way medicine sometimes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I've always thought that this could, I mean, we give him a lot of crap, but this couldn't have happened without Withrow and the Cancer Center. No. Well, I mean, certainly there were lots of other clinicians over there who had the same sensibility, and you know, we worked with every service, and still do. You know, Gail and her team work with every service over there. But I think uh, Steve's uh, willingness to let us develop protocols and his willingness to let us be in on his cases. You know, we came to rounds every week on Fridays and talked about cases not from a medical point of view, but from an emotional human point of view. Um, he was our champion. He, he helped us get funding. Um, I, I think without the, the true emotional pull of cancer and the huge program that he was building, I'm not sure that the Argus Institute at least would have grown to be the size that it, that it is and, and have the impact that it's had. So yeah, he was very instrumental. Because let me, I'm just going to double check since I'm a one-man band, double check, make sure we're still in focus and whatnot. Yeah. Um, the, the, the amount of people willing to either fly cross country or drive cross country. I remember doing a kid from Boston who mm -hmm. came in with, I, I forget, I think it was a Rottweiler mm -hmm. and, and, and he ultimately lost him and I remember you guys jumping in and it was, it was one of the more stark stories that I, that I followed at the yeah. time. But I mean, the amount of people that would would come would come to the cancer center yeah. fully armed with with whatever you got to do do but yeah. then turn 
once once that you know there was no longer anything to do when it became palliative or whatever yeah I mean, yeah there were so many clients like that yeah yeah i talk a little bit about the clients that that you recognized early on that kind of set us up for success well you know when, when we first started talking to clients over there people would apologize for crying about their animal or they would say i'm sorry i just it's just that I love him. I'm, you know, I really do love him. And we'd say, well, of course you do. But it was almost like they had to literally come out of the closet, you know, because people were sort of embarrassed and ashamed of the feelings they had for their animals. And I think the combination of grief counseling and cancer treatment allowed people all over the country to say, yeah, I love my animal. And yes, I'm going to spend whatever I want, would spend on a human family member on this pet. And I'm going to buy him clothes if I want to. You know, I mean, it's completely changed the human animal bond and, and how people demonstrate their love for their animals from the time I started in this field in the early 80s to now is completely different. You know, now there's no shame about it, no embarrassment. Everybody is just takes that for granted. But I think, you know, the cancer treatment and everything else that has happened in veterinary medicine has been responsible for that in a large way because they've been willing to, to treat these animals and let people spend whatever they want to without judging them, you know. And um, veterinary medicine can do anything to an animal that human medicine can do. Lots of people can't afford that, and they'll mortgage their homes. You know, they'll they'll go without things for themselves. I don't know. Everybody has to make that own decision. You know, on their own. I I remember talking to a a woman one time and saying, you know, honestly, is this worth it? Do you want to do this? I mean, she got fired from her job because she was gone so many days um, treating her animal. You know, so now she doesn't have an income. She's going to mortgage her house to try to treat her pet. Uh, these were difficult decisions, you know, and that's how strong the bond was. And it's difficult for veterinarians because they don't want to just be taking people's money, and yet they can't do their jobs for free, you know. So it's a difficult balance. Um, but, yeah, we had many clients like that. So let me get this right. So Dr. Withrow went looking for counselor types in another college in an in another department at CSU yeah yeah I mean he just made he just made a phone call you know because we had um, Dr. Alicia Cook and Dr. Kevin Ultrambruns were nationally known for their grief counseling and that's who he called he called Alicia and said you know I found you in the directory looks like you know about grief here's the situation and Alicia came to me and a few other people and said I don't have time to do this, but it sounds really interesting. Are you interested? And, you know, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that changed my life. That one phone call changed my life. So. Because you came at it from a, as a dog lover. Well, yeah. And I, you know, if Alicia hadn't come and asked me about it, you know, I never would have had this career. So if Steve hadn't called Alicia, I wouldn't have ever known about it. So, you know, it's looking back on it now, it's like those little tiny things that you say yes to, and they change your whole life. And I feel that way about Steve calling her and saying, hey, anybody interested in this? So, yeah. So the landscape out there for veterinary, professional veterinary medicine programs, what, no, there wasn't a Withrow at Davis or Michigan State or Cornell or? I you know, mean, not really. I mean, he, when, when I started over there, his program was very small. It was Steve, a nurse, Joan Sheets, um, I think there was a resident and possibly a like postdoc fellow, and that's it. It was small. Um, I remember meeting with Joan on you know some Saturdays, just brainstorming what we might do and what they might need, and you know they were not a big team. That was it. So and there was a grief counseling program at um, AMC in New York City. That was Susan Cohen. Um, but she didn't have a big clinical program. She was mostly training veterinarians, um, and she had an office like on the eighth floor, and they would call her if they had a really difficult case, and she would come talk to people. But she wasn't in on cases. And there was also a, um, a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania, and he was doing research. So he was doing a little bit more of a clinical program. But that was, that was it when we started our program. 
So, you know, we, we learn by trial and error. And if we hadn't had the Animal Cancer Center growing right along, you know, with us, we, we really grew together. And I think that was the beauty of it, the synergy of it. Did the ideas for comfort rooms, euthanasia, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the types of euthanasia you did, was that, I mean, how, how was that schemed by, was that come, come at it from your career or, I mean? A it was, well, it was a combination. You know, the comfort room certainly was our idea, but we couldn't just do that. We had to get people on board, you know, that would say, okay, we'll try it. Um, so we'd go to them with ideas and, you know, little by little, we'd kind of implement some of those things. Um, the euthanasia protocol even, um, you know, when they first started, when we had clients present, that was a big deal. We said, look, people want to be there. And, you know, they're like, well, okay, they can be there, but they can't hold their animal. And we're like, okay, they want to hold their animal, you know, how can we do this? And so little by little, we came up with ways that we could kind of inch people into being more comfortable with people literally, you know, surrounding their pet, sobbing while they were, you know, being put down and they still could do their jobs and still do their, um, th what they needed to do medically. So it was a little by little, you know, trying things. The Animal Cancer ca uh, Center came up with the idea of sedating the animals, putting a catheter in and sedating the animals before they would actually put the euthanasia solution in. Because when they, before they were doing that, they would euth put the euthanasia solution in and there'd be all kinds of sort of side effects. You know, twitching, agonal breaths, sometimes you know, things that you didn't really want to see or witness. And so if they would sedate the animal first with a catheter, those side effects were very, very minimal. And so people could be there. You know, and we came up with a communication around that. We came up with, okay, we'll tell people, here's what you might see. It's not likely to happen, but if it does, it's normal. And don't, you don't have to get panicked. We all know what to do. You know, so we added the communication and added the sort of support protocols, and then they could do their medical job and not worry about it. So it was really a good team, and still is. I'm sounding like it was like happened before, and it's still happening. Yeah. <laughs> but isn't it funny that like like today, you know, like those two clients I talked to you, told you about on Friday. Yeah. Like, isn't it funny? Like, they couldn't imagine their world without such a thing. Yeah. And, and here you are on the oh, cutting yeah. edge. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, it used to be really different. You know, when I first um, came to graduate school here, I had a golden retriever that had cancer and had to be put down. And actually, Withrow and his resident, one of his residents, was my doctor over there. And, um, and you know, we put Bear down just on a gurney, you know, one day. And I left him there because I didn't have anything to do with him in terms of cremation. That wasn't even an option at the time. And so I had to just leave him, his body, with them. And I found out later, because I worked there, you know, that at that time they just took the bodies out to the dump. And there was a special area where they would put the animal bodies, but that was all they had to do with them. They didn't have other options. So, yeah, people take it for granted. Even the vet students take it for granted that it's always been this way. And really the paradigm has changed dramatically just since the 1990s. So it hasn't been that long. So, what was it? Was it um, you know? It's in, I, I understand the call from from Withrow and whatnot was client treatment, humane treatment of client. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but when did you guys decide to? Well, we got to train more veterinarians. We got to push this out. Yeah, well, I mean that was sort of us getting guidance from Tony Knight and and you know other faculty members saying. If you're going to be over here and doing this, you know, you need to start having some sort of a formalized program. And if you want to stay here and be funded, you probably need to teach, you know, because we need, that's what we do. That's our mission. So it, it was us wanting to pass on that information, but also getting that guidance and that invitation from people to start teaching their students. So we started getting called in to do guest lectures, you know, like in, uh, sophomore, I think Bernie Rollin was one of the first people to invite us to come into an ethics class and do a lecture. Um, and we went into the junior um, practicum, the junior um, lecture hall and did some lectures. And what really, really got us going is when we were offered to do a junior elective where 
the um, junior students could choose to take a class with us and just learn more about how do you communicate with clients effectively? How do you deal with euthanasia? What is grief? And how do you feel comfortable with it in a room when people are crying? So that junior elective was two weeks and that really took off. Then from there, we got a senior rotation, clinical rotation. So we would have four students with us. Um, I think we did one a month and they would come and they would actually be the counselors. And what was really cool about that is that um, somewhere along the way, we got a little bit of funding and got to build our own counseling office. It's not there anymore, which I'm really sad about, but it was a little office right there in the waiting room. And we put in a one-way mirror. And so our students could be in the comfort room working with people, helping them when they were euthanizing animals, and we could be behind the window watching them and critiquing them. So those senior rotations were wildly popular. We had waiting lists of people that wanted to take them. And it was because they were so skill-based and people, they were really learning how to be comfortable and have skills that they could be confident in um, in terms of having people present at euthanasias. So it was, it was really, really fun and really, really exciting to be part of that kind of growth in training and teaching. Was that that right where the scale is now, right in the, on the corner? I think so. Down the yeah, it's kind thing. of, I think actually the, the check-in desk or maybe it's the budget desk. It's kind of yeah, a rounded right. desk. We were, that's where that's our right. office was, sort of right there. Right. Yeah. And they renovated that and put it in that nice area. That yeah. 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 You mentioned Bernie. So again, it goes back to, you know, like Boss invited or accepted and invited Bernie over like he did you guys. Exactly. I mean, again, I yeah. think it, it says a lot about that era. Yeah. You know, and Boss started the, or allowed Withrow to go do the Absolutely. cancer center. I mean, there yeah. were a lot of things at play here that. Yeah. That, visionary leadership took care of. Yeah, he was a visionary. Yeah, and he was he was just such a good Can you start that by saying boss Jim Voss was a visionary because people won't, you know, my question won't be in the response. Yeah, Jim Voss was a visionary. He he could see the benefit of interdisciplinary programs. And just as he supported Steve in, you know, developing the cancer center, he supported us eventually. <laughs> in coming in and adding that dimension to, you know, cancer to, I mean, we work with CCU in emergencies. Um, Jim also really understood how we were good for students. You know, we were helping them have skills that were marketable. When they went out into the field to look for jobs, they knew things and could do things that students from other um, schools really hadn't had, that kind of training. So he recognized the value in, you know, having sort of cutting edge programs at his hospital. And he really encouraged that. And I think the thing, the most enduring part of all of this, or, or one of the most enduring is that it's so customer centric or client based. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm, it's, yep. it's, and you know, it's probably not any, not much different from when you you know, during the changes program, Gail and yeah. Maria and Aaron are yeah. probably institute or you're probably doing similar things. Right? I think so. I don't think they're doing quite as much teaching and training. I think they're they're doing more, you know, clinical work. Um, I think Jane Shaw, who's doing more of the communication um, teaching, has taken over more of that part of it. So I don't think they're doing the senior rotations like we did. I'm not sure. I hope I'm not speaking out of line, but yeah. But that but that continuity yes. of, of of client and yep. how we treat the client yep. is, 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 remains. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, CSU is pretty known for that. We have clients that always say, boy, if I were sick, I'd want to come here, you know, and I'm sure they're still saying that. Mm -hmm. um, it always made me feel really proud to have the residents or interns or students come out and I'd listen to them in the waiting room and how they introduce themselves and how they would talk to people. It, they, they were just so skilled and so compassionate. and. It was because that was the culture and is the culture there. You know, CSU is known for that um, culture of real compassion and care. And I think that comes from the leadership. You know, they model that. And so other people see, oh, this is how I, I do it. And then they take that out into their practices. And it really has benefited veterinary medicine. Because, I mean, when you look at it, though, I mean, when you look at veterinary medicine and its traditions, and 
how slow it is be, and they were to ad adapt out of those traditions yeah you know to yeah. Get, like boss's reticence at the start you know? yeah i mean that was basically the yeah. the old way of doing things mm -hmm. you know, sure thing. and, and that's normal have somebody yeah well of course it's normal yeah. but, but to to turn that on its head yeah says a lot about this place yeah it does well and you know what unfortunately i think dr boss was convinced of at least our value uh, when there was a suicide and we were able to help um, not only the students but the faculty, the staff, you know, everybody who was touched by that. And I think he saw, okay, maybe this really does have some science behind it. You know, maybe there really is some ways of going about this so that it's more than just being nice to people. Um, and he was really grateful that we were there and could help. And so after that, he, he did kind of a turnaround and he used to call us a lot. You know, if he had a, a dicey situation or something that he thought maybe we could help him with. Um, and, you know, that, that helped. We always said yes. <laughs> so. Do you think, though, that, you know, that the, when dogs started sleeping on, in beds and, I mean, you know, yeah. this, you know, that whole shift in, mm -hmm. in uh, the mentality of the yeah. human animal bond, I think you kind of, you, I mean, what was, was that? recognized by recognized and emphasized by you guys to kind of go that way or you know was it Steve's uh, you know just that whole dynamic yeah. of, of the of the human animal bond becoming it so so critical yeah well I mean it started in veterinary medicine before either Steve or I were around because it really started when people started doing small animal practice you know veterinary medicine used to be primarily equine and large animal farm animals and so even when I was a kid, there weren't small animal veterinarians around. I grew up in Iowa, and you know, if your dog or cat was sick, you took them to the horse doctor. You know, there, there weren't veterinary practices for dogs and cats. So, you know, veterinary medicine started making that switch. And then I think as they made that switch, they started realizing, oh, there are people here, <laughs> you know, because farmers and ranchers probably were attached to their animals, but they didn't show it. That wasn't really an okay thing to do. But dog and cat owners, they did show it. And so veterinarians started realizing, I need some people skills here, as well as medical skills. And I think, you know, all those disciplines started to come about because they wanted to help people as much as animals. You know, if you talk to Steve Withrow or any of the, the clinicians over at the hospital, really they're as concerned about the people that they work with as they are about the animals. They, they truly want to be there for people and they want to help people. So, you know, they needed some skills that were, that were human based. So I think that was where we could, you know, come in and it was timing. The field was ripe for that because they had already, you know, had that experience where if we're going to treat small animals, we also need to be able to talk to the people and we're not sure we know how to do that. So it was great. That was the first time I ever heard the expression, there's a person at the end of the leash. It mm -hmm. goes back yep. to that yep. era. You know? Yep, you know, and we picked up on the human-animal bond and, you know, in, in my field, it's called client-centered therapy where, you know, you're, you're listening to the client and you're, you're finding out what they want rather than what you think you, they should do. Um, and so we just extrapolated and took that model you know, over to the veterinary um, school and talked about relationship theory. You know, how do you treat relationships? How do you hear what they need rather than what you think they should do? Um, and that seemed to be really pertinent there. It was almost like a, a, a parent-child you know, relationship. And what we used to say is that veterinarians are like pediatricians. Um, because they're they're dealing with this very vulnerable member of the family who can't really speak for themselves, who can't really say what they need, and so you have to deal with the parent, you know, and you have to educate the parent, you have to help them understand why you want to do something and what you're going to do, but ultimately it's their decision. And so it was kind of a new way of, of listening to their clients and a new way of approaching their cases. And of course, the human animal bond was a big term that was just emerging at that point. Um, so we picked up on that. But as things uh, progressed in the field, we came up with the idea of bond centered practice. That was also a CSU Argus Institute um, phrase that we coined. And we got a lot of flack from that because um, veterinarians have now seen their, um, their practice sort of 
grow into something that's more litigious. You know, people now say, look, this is not property. This is a member of my family. And if you made a mistake, I'm gonna sue you. That didn't used to happen. So there's pros and cons with, with the human animal bond becoming so strong. And, you know, we're a part of making that strong. So we also got some flack for it because some, some veterinarians weren't happy about that. So they have to deal with insurance now. You know, it's, it's changed the field in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'm so damn naive. Gail was telling me about dealing with, you know, crazy people coming in and saying, yeah. you know, doing wild things. I said, you're kidding me. You yeah. Know, I just didn't, I never even suspected things like that. Yeah. And, yeah. I had a client threaten yeah, the my threats. daughter. Yeah. And, Car and Carolyn had a, a guy, you know, we didn't have a way out of our uh, counseling office. It was a one door and we were trapped in there. And she had a guy come in one time who was drunk and he stood in the doorway with his hands like this and was threatening her. And she was trapped, you know? So yeah, yeah. it can be scary. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so naive. But you mentioned, um, uh, you know, it changed your life. What are you, what are you most proud of given those? Hmm. And you also said you were proud of certain things, but the, in summary, what, what, what yeah. are you most proud of that, you know, 35 years later you had three dedicated people that are, that are doing yeah. What you did 35 years or what? How many years ago? Did yeah, you? well, yeah, it's been 35 years. I was there when it started. I've been gone from CSU for 15 years, so I was there for 20 years. Um, you know, personally, I think what I'm most proud of is um, my bachelor's degree is in journalism. So I think what we did well at CSU is everything that was happening over there and all the protocols and the techniques and things that we were discovering and developing, uh, we wrote down and we published a lot. Um, we were in all the journals. We did a lot of keynote talks at conferences and you know did a lot of papers. Um, we were the first non-veterinarians to publish in the compendium. Um, Carolyn was one of the first non-veterinarians to talk at the World Veterinary Conference. So we, we did a lot of um, talks and trainings and, and publishing. And we wrote the first textbook um, on the topic. And I think that's what I'm most proud of because it really spread the ideas and really gave people um, out there in the field who didn't have a vet school you know, to go to and learn from right away. Um, it gave them information about how they could do it. I think we made it simple enough and step-by-step -step kind of protocol oriented that they could implement it in their in their um, practices. So what I'm most proud of is that people are doing client present euthanasia now as a standard. You know that that we made that um, acceptable. Yeah, it's pretty cool. By chronicling everything, you've also put CSU on the map. Yeah, we helped we helped do that. Yeah, I think we we had um, we we built a good reputation for CSU for for that particular discipline. Yeah. We did. But I mean, in reality, I mean, that vet school and that cancer center specifically, but I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it, they're just so yeah. threaded together. They are. Open together. Yeah, yeah, they are. I mean, I think Argus works with every service over there, almost every service, you know, and certainly does a lot of cases that aren't cancer cases. But, um, you know, predominantly, those are the clients they work with because they're the ones that are so bonded and you know probably are there for the longest time you know over weeks and weeks and weeks in terms of treatment so you get to know them pretty well yeah, that and cardio seems like yes a lot of cardio absolutely yeah. yeah um what else anything else that was great man you were like an encyclopedia <laughs> You're, no, you're the wiki, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the oh, historian, yeah, you know. Really, you truly are. Um, I don't think there's anything else that really stands out in my mind. I mean, I'm so proud of CSU and the Argus Institute that they've hung in there and they're still going and they're still funded. And yet I know how tenuous their funding is because I've been there. And I know that, you know, if they could get something established that would really lock that in, that would make all the difference in the world. Um, you know, there was a time where we were, our funding was cut and we were going to be gone. This was in the early 90s. And the students saved us. They um, circulated petitions 
and they got so many signatures on those petitions that they had to bring us back. And we didn't even, we weren't even very well funded at that point. I mean, it was like $12,000 or something. But, you know, it's, it's always seen as kind of overhead. And, you know, this kind of help for people is always seen as something that's a little bit expendable. Um, you know, like Tony Knight used to always say to me, if I go to the faculty and I say, okay, we only have this much in our pot of money, do you want another Argus counselor or do you want another nurse? He said, they're always going to choose the nurse because we always need nurses. So it's always that tenuous and it shouldn't be, you know, because it's really essential to medicine that people feel like they can count on the folks that are helping their pets and that they understand how important they are to them and that they get help too. And I think clients will be the first to say this yeah. is not <laughs> extraneous business. Oh, anymore. absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you've, if you've ever talked to anyone and, and if, they, if they, a client, ever talk, has talked to anyone oh. in Argus, they will be oh, yeah. forever sold. Yeah, and you know, the hard thing about that is because we team our cases with every medical service there, Unfortunately, a lot of times the donations go to the medical service because they want to fund research or they want to fund, you know, them getting a certain piece of equipment that they need in order to do their jobs better. And I don't begrudge that. That's fine. But Argus often gets overlooked. Um, often we're just as instrumental in the case, but we don't get the funding. So, you know, that's why they need something kind of permanent. Uh, and I think, you know, to, to her credit, and I don't know if you were involved in it, but, but you know, like things like the pet memorial, the annual pet memorial that mm -hmm. Gail yep. puts on, yep. the, and the bricks, yep. and, the, you know, just a general party, you know, cake and party for a yeah. dearly departed. Yeah. I mean, you got to speak up. Yep. You have to speak up because yeah. it's just too important. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely clients are the ones who, you know, have kept this program going. Obviously, if they didn't like it and didn't feel it was valuable, it wouldn't be there. You know, so, yeah. And, you know, it's not the kind of thing that, that we've ever been able to charge for because um, you can't really go to somebody and be part of the team and say, okay, I've helped you now. Uh, let's see, that'll be $500, you know. It's awkward. And it, it, that doesn't really put um, the hospital in a good light. So the Argus's hands have always been tied in terms of how do we bring income into the hospital. And there hasn't ever been an easy way to do that. And so, and there's never been support for that. And so they're in a double bind, you know, they do great work and they spend hours on cases, but they don't bring money in. So that again is why they're seen as overhead and always are vulnerable. So they need some permanent funding. That's a good way to go. <laughs> that's, that's the point. I've been at many board meetings <laughs> <laughs> saying, look, people, don't you see, see this? this? Yeah. 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 I would think, yeah, it's a tough situation. Yeah. You know, very tough situation. Yeah, it really is. Matters of the heart. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, in my profession, if I were in private practice, you know, my colleagues who are counselors, they charge 120 bucks an hour, mm -hmm. you know, to do what we do over there every day for free. And so, you know, really, it's, it's a weird model. It's not a good business model, and yet, you know, it's, it's essential. And, you know, with all the teaching and everything we do, that's why teaching really rooted us in the whole um, hospital, you know, budget. Yeah. Because we had a role there that was beyond just, um, oh, being nice people. Yeah, more people saw it as, as necessary or, yeah. you know, equal, I guess, mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, and now that now that the counselors over there aren't aren't doing as much of the teaching, I mean they're still teaching in their clinical cases, but I don't think they're doing as much of it as we were at one point because of Jane taking that communication part. Um, you know, I th I think um, they're under a different kind of budget structure, and you know I want them to be seen as, you know, just as valuable and as permanent as any other teaching service over there well so. we might, there must have been some tough times where people lost sight of, of the value and whatnot right and, and then you I sure don't, you know there, does it come back does a, does a particular client come back or a champion like Withrow or you know that sort of thing it's it's because it does wane I think well I don't know you know <laughs> I think for a long time I was sort of that bulldog over there and you know like Dean Boss, I remember one time, 
had given us raises or given us a little bit more money in our budget and for something I can't remember what it was exactly. And I saw him one day at the hospital and he said, okay, are you happy now? And I said, no, <laughs> you know, here's the next thing we want. And so I sort of developed that reputation where I was never happy. And, you know, I, I was always wanting something more. And sometimes people complained about that. But Tony Knight always said to me, well, they're saying that you're never satisfied and you never, you know, you always want more. And yet that's what everybody does who's successful and builds a program. So he said, you need to keep doing that. And you, you, you need to just be able to not care if they get a little bit, you know, frustrated with you. And I said, fine with me, you know, because you do have to be the squeaky wheel and you just have to continually be in people's faces and say, look, you know, we're here, we're really important. Yes, I know you need that money, but so do we, and make your case. And it's just a constant, constant, constant situation where you have to be making your case. Because you recognize the true value of it. Yeah. And, and it was well, yeah. important to you. I mean, it, yeah. was, it was part of who you were. And then, yes. And you're battling, yeah. you know, the science side of things. Yes, you know, we were the soft science. science you know, it was soft and science. Yeah, but that's why, you know, with all the writing we did, um, we didn't just write anecdotal, you know, it was part of, part of what we did was that, but we had research to back it up. You know, we, we, we backed up everything with studies and with research from our field and from veterinary medicine. But, you know, we, we truly, I think, could make convincing cases about things because we weren't just saying, if you want to be nice, here's what you should do, you know. Um, it was a scholarly, um, serious um, mission that we took on and people recognize that I think because and to this day or nowadays or current situation I mean it's it, client student probably most of the faculty would say duh of course <laughs> well yeah right? I think they kind of take it for granted yeah, at this well, point something about it. yeah I mean, it's, yeah now it's so ingrained right in, in the, in the culture, right like you which said. is exactly what I'm most proud of you know, that is what I'm most proud of, that, that they really don't even know that there was a time not that long ago where none of this existed and none of this was done. And that people were very, very scared about even being in the room if somebody was crying. You know, oh, I can't go in there. And now, you know, gosh, I see people writing in the vet journals and they're talking about, you know, being with crying clients all the time. And it's just a, it's just a normal part of their day. And they don't seem intimidated by it, and I think that's great. So that I, I feel like we had a real role in that, or played a real role in that. We used to be. I, 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 there was fear in the eyes of the. Oh stuff yeah. Of people. Oh know, yeah. So, my God. Oh I yeah, mean. and you know, people used to say, "Oh well, you know, because veterinary medicine is becoming more uh, female, you know, that it's easier for the women to take on this." But honestly, the people. When I was there, the, the people that were the best at working with people who were emotional and crying clients and who had more sensitivity and compassion than anyone else were a lot of the guys, a lot of the men. They were absolutely magnificent and had so much skill and so much heart. So it, it's not just a female, you know, or a more feminine approach to things. It, it's a human, it's being human in the face of loss and grief. And I think that's what CSU has shown people is we're all people and we all have these feelings. Why not talk about them and deal with them?